Clay, one of our graduating residents, and the students, uh, each of our residents must get ran out for the their training. And so it's part of the requirement for graduation. So we're going to talk about her subject is media use and effect on adolescent behavior. So, yep. Good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me? Everybody in the back? Okay. Um, so my topic is media use and its effects on adolescent behavior. Um, the reason that I chose to do this is um, for those of you who don't know me, I just recently got married in September um, and I now have a stepson, so I'm not used to having a child around the house. So one night I was sitting there and I was watching Scandal, my normal show that I watch, and um, a little scene came on and my stepson walked in the room and kind of had this confused look on his face. Um, I immediately changed the channel and thought, I oh, probably shouldn't be watching that while he's here. But that's something that I had never really thought about before. Um, so I just kind of want to talk about what is shown on TV these days, especially on just like primetime TV that anybody can watch um, and go through kind of what our kids are doing and watching and all that kind of stuff and how it's affecting them. Um, first of all, I wanted to ask everybody who routinely asks parents or patients about how much screen time they have just on a regular well child check nobody oh, there's a couple okay um, well I was not routinely doing it before I did my presentation so now hopefully I will remember to do that from now on because it is a very important thing that we need to be asking our patients so I have nothing to disclose uh, my objectives are to review the prevalence of media usage in adolescents, to discuss the adverse effects of media on adolescents, and to summarize the AAP guidelines for media usage and to identify our roles as pediatricians. So who's had this patient before? <laughs> they come in, they've got their cell phone or their iPad or whatever, they're listening to music, they're not paying any attention to you. Um, so this is just to let us realize how prevalent this kind of stuff is. Almost every patient, adolescent patient that we have that comes in has their iPhone. They have access to internet. Um, they can kind of do whatever they want to do right there on their phone. So what are teenagers watching on TV and why should we care about it? Um, I'll be honest with you, I had to Google this. Apparently I'm getting old and I don't know what the kids are watching anymore. Um, but these are just a couple of shows that are, um, this. One in particular called Catfish is on MTV. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever seen it, but basically it's like these people are um, online and they're talking to each other, but they haven't met each other, and this show is about whenever they meet, and then they realize that maybe the person they've been talking to is not who they said they were. Um, so I don't know how bad this show is, but that's one that was pretty popular. This one, Gossip Girl, um, it says right there on it, every parent's nightmare. So. That's one thing our kids are watching. 16 and pregnant. So that's a good one <laughs> for our teenagers to be watching. Um, this is Bachelor Pad, where they basically get a bunch of beautiful people together in one room and see what happens. Um, and then this is uh, Teen Mom. And this one, I think, kind of sort of focuses on the reality of what can happen um, if you get pregnant when you're a teenager, but it also kind of glamorizes it at the same time. It's, it makes some teenagers want to do this. So just a little bit of background on it. Um, the average eight to 10 year old spends about eight hours a day watching um, TV or with different types of media, whether it's internet or video games or whatever. And then the older kids and teenagers spend more than 11 hours per day. Um, so that's a lot, that's a lot of time. And some of the older kids, it's less TV and it's more computers or cell phones um, or even some of the music that they listen to. And then the television is the most common of the, the amount of time that they spend per day with about four hours of TV time per day in these kids. Um, and then TVs in bedrooms. Um, I personally grew up having a TV in my bedroom. My stepson has a TV in his bedroom, so I'm probably going to think a little bit differently about that now too. But, um, so 19% of infants, infants have a TV in their bedroom. 29% um, of two to three year olds, 43% of four to six year olds, um, and 68% of children over eight years of age, which is a lot. Um, having a TV in the bedroom, according to this particular um, 
uh, article that I read, which is a pol policy statement on media violence, um, said that having a TV in the bedroom increases viewing time by one hour per day. But one of the other articles that I read said that it actually can increase it by three to four hours per day. Um, it increases the risk of obesity by 31%. Um, it doubles the risk of smoking, and then parents are less able to monitor what's being viewed. So the parents have gone to bed or whatever, and the kids are up watching TV, and they're watching whatever comes on late night, which is usually not something that we really want our kids watching. Um, and then again, they also stay up later, so it messes with their sleep too, having a TV in their bedroom. Um, and this is just a little graph. This is from the uh, Use Risk Behavior Surveillance, which is on the CDC's website. Um, so this is the percentage of high school students who play video or computer games or use a computer for more than three hours a day. And this is based on race. I'll show you another one that's based on their grade. Um, it's a little bit higher in the black population than it is in the Hispanic or the white, but not a huge significant difference. Um, about 50% spend three hours a day or more with video games or computers. And then it tends to decrease a little bit by grade, so that's one good thing. Um, and this is from the same study and it just shows uh, high school students who watch TV for three or more hours per day. This is again based on race and there's a more significant difference right here in the black population versus the Hispanic or the white population and you know it's 50 something percent right there with the black population watching TV. And again that also decreases with grade. So what are, why do we worry about this? What are the bad things that can happen from kids watching a lot of TV or playing a bunch of video games? Um, they have the increased risk of having some violent behavior, um, increased substance abuse, including smoking, alcohol, and illicit drug use, marijuana use, um, obesity and eating disorders, increased uh, risky sexual behavior, which is what I kind of was originally planning on focusing on, but I put a bunch of stuff for the other things as well. Um, and then the increased risk of behavior problems such as ADHD and depression. So media violence. Um, homicide, suicide, and trauma are the leading causes of mortality in the pediatric population. Um, of all deaths by homicide or suicide, about half are gun related. Um, and there's an article in Peds in Review from, from this month, from February, um, that is called uh, Preventing Gun Injuries in Children. And it actually said that like 64% of um, homicides are due to firearms. Um, so that's pretty significant. Um, and then firearms are the cause of death in 26% um, of 10 to 14 year olds um, that commit suicide and 43% of 15 to 19 year olds. Um, for young black males, uh, homicide is the leading cause of death, accounting for nearly 45% of all deaths. Um, media has been shown to contribute to aggressive behavior, desensitization of violence, nightmares, fear of being harmed. Um, and a lot of people were talking about this at the time of the Columbine shootings, that the, um, the people who did that were playing a bunch of violent video games. Um, so that's something that we've all heard before. <coughs> And then media violence is one of the causal risk factors um, of real life violence and aggression. And all these different societies, the AAP, AMA, um, all these different things agree that entertainment violence does have a, an effect on um, children. So what exactly is desensitization? Have y'all heard that word before? Um, so basically desensitization is after you um, watch a certain um, scene like as either a sexual scene or a violent scene or something like that over and over and um, you get kind of used to seeing that so it doesn't evoke the same response that you would originally have had um, and this has been like I said observed in response to violence and sexual media um, in this study, the parental desensitization to violence and sex in the movies took a group of parents, um, they took a thousand parents that had kids ages six to 17 years old, um, and then they showed them these movie clips, it was just short little movie clips, um, and then they asked the parents, at what age would you let your child watch this particular movie or clip or whatever, um, and all of the, the little clips were either had 
violent things or sexual things in them and all these movies that these clips were from were either rated PG-13 or they were rated R. Um, and then it showed that as parents watched these clips, the age that they would let their kids watch it went down. So initially for violence, um, they said that they wouldn't let their kids watch it until they're almost 17. And then after watching these clips, it decreased to about 14 years old. Um, and then for the sexual content, um, they started at 17 and went down to about 14 as well with that one. Um, and I'll show you that on the next slide. So this is a graph from that study. Um, and this is, you can see that it's got the age appropriateness on the side. Um, and you can see as they watch it that the age decreases. Um, the younger parents tend to become desensitized more quickly than the older parents. Um, you see that in graph A. Um, and then in graph B, it shows parents that watch a bunch of movies. So parents who have seen more than 11 movies um, within the recent past um, tend to desensitize a lot more quickly than parents who don't watch the movies. And C and D were well, D wasn't so interesting. C was pretty interesting to me. The parents with the older kids tend to um, not desensitize as quickly as parents with the younger kids. I would kind of think that would be reversed, but I guess they're thinking, oh, my kid is right there at that age, and I don't want them watching that right now. Um, and then um, parents that had girls tend to not desensitize quite as quickly as parents of boys. Um. <clears throat> So with media violence, by the time kiddos are 18 years old, they will have seen about 200,000 um, acts of violence just on TV. This isn't including movies, this isn't including internet, YouTube, video games, nothing like that. This is just on TV. 61% um, of programming between 1995 and 1997 showed interpersonal violence, and 100% of animated films in the U.S. between 1937 and 1999 showed violence. That was kind of shocking to me. Um, and just a couple of pictures. Hopefully our kids aren't watching The Simpsons, but it comes on TV and, you know, they could easily have access to that. Um, but the other things that I thought was interesting, um, Batman. Surely every kid has probably seen Batman at some point in time. And you think it's not bad because Batman's a good guy. Um, but it does show Batman using violence as a way to, you know, beat the bad guys and all that. So it really is not sending the best message to our kiddos. Because um, it, it just shows kiddos that violence is the way to solve problems. Um, and then I had to throw the Ninja Turtles up there because that's my stepson's favorite. We watch that a lot. <laughs> um, and interestingly, the movie rating systems that we have, you know, like, PG, PG-13, R, um, that does not really predict the number of violent scenes that we see. They tend to um, kind of downrate the violent scenes. Now, if there's bad language or sexual content or something, they're rated higher, but they don't really take into account the violence as much as they used to. Um, <clears throat> prolonged exposure to this violent media um, results in increased acceptance of violence as appropriate behavior in kids. Um, and then media violence is associated with all these kind of problems. Um, like I said, violent behavior, <laughs> bullying, um, fear is a big one. Fear that someone is going to harm them because they're seeing all this stuff on TV so they get afraid that somebody's going to actually come hurt them. Um, they have trouble sleeping, nightmares, and it can even cause depression. Um, and then most entertainment media that you see whenever someone is harmed or even killed, it doesn't show the consequences of that. So it just is kind of casual and then they move on. Um, it doesn't show um, anyone getting in trouble for it a lot of times. It doesn't show the families of whoever it is that got harmed. It um, doesn't show like emotional consequences or anything. So kids don't realize that you know, some of that violent stuff is a big deal. Um, and then violence in sexual context and uh, comic violence are really dangerous because they're associating this violence with a, a good, positive feeling. And these are just a couple of TV shows. Um, I have never watched this show in my life, but I know a lot of people do. Um, this is Walking Dead. Obviously, there is a bunch of violence in this show. 
Um, this show is called The Following. Uh, it comes on Fox. It comes on primetime. Um, and it's showing this guy right here. He's got this girl tied up. I don't really know what's happening in this scene. I don't watch this show either. Um, this is one I do watch. This is Criminal Minds. It's a pretty good show, actually, but there is some violence in that show. And then How to Get Away with Murder. It's right there in the title. It's called How to Get Away with Murder. <laughs> and this show comes on Channel 3 at 9 o'clock at night. Um, so kiddos easily could watch that. I mean, even if you have basic cable, you can watch this TV show. And these are just a couple of video games. Again, I don't play video games, so I don't really know a whole lot about these. Um, this is Halo. They go around shooting people. And this is one of those where you can put the little headset on and you can talk to people and kind of engage in it that way. Um, and one of the articles that I read about video games in particular was that they are really bad, like worse than just sitting there watching TV because the kids are actually involved in it. Um, and they're involved in shooting people and, and that kind of thing. And that affects them more than just sitting there kind of passively watching it on TV. This is another video game. Again, I don't play video games. Um, this is Grand Theft Auto. Um, in this video game, from what I have read, um, you can steal cars, you can sell drugs, you can do drugs, you can have sex with prostitutes. Um, so I don't think I will ever allow my child to get this video game. <laughs> but a lot of parents don't realize, you know, it's called Grand Theft Auto. They think that it's about them driving cars or stealing cars or something like that. They don't realize what else is involved in it. And a lot of parents don't even look at the ratings. They do have a rating system for video games, but a lot of parents just don't even think about that. Um, so these are the AAP recommendations, um, kind of specifically for media violence. And these, um, these are similar throughout this whole talk, so it might get a little bit repetitive, but hopefully y'all will remember it at the end. Um, so as pediatricians, we need to be aware of the effects of media um, on the physical and the mental health of our patients. Um, we need to ask at least two media-related questions at every well-child visit that we have. We need to ask how much screen time um, is the patient having, um, and is there a television set or an internet connection in the child's bedroom. Um, and then encourage parents to remove the TV or the internet um, connection from the bedroom. Encourage parents to actually watch TV with the kids, see what they're actually watching, and talk to them about what they're watching and um, why it may not be real, you know, it's TV, it's not real life, um, and then talk to them about maybe some of the bad things that they might see. Um, make sure that they understand what's going on with what they're watching on TV. And then limit screen time to one to two hours per day. And this is for kiddos that are over two years old. I kind of focused on the older kids. Um, if they're less than two, the, the recommendation is to not have any screen time at all. Um, and then we as pediatricians need to make sure that we don't have any violent media playing in our waiting rooms or our patients that are in the hospital aren't sitting there watching stuff on their TVs. Um, and then encourage parents and schools to educate children to be media literate. And this, again, media literate refers to um, having kids watch things kind of critically and think about it um, and realize that that's not real life. And then advocate for more child positive media. So avoid the glamorization of weapons, um, eliminate the use of violence in um, funny or sexual um, sort of context. Um, and then video games, which I don't know how much control we as pediatricians will have over video games, but we need to kind of advocate for video games to not have um, people or living targets um, that they shoot at. So kind of switching over to the substance abuse side of it, um, more than $25 billion a year is spent on advertising for tobacco, alcohol, and prescription drugs. Um, on average, one drinking scene is shown every 22 minutes on just primetime television, but on MTV, which is what a lot of teenagers watch, there's a drinking scene every 14 minutes on average. So they're actually exposed to more than we are. And I, of course I had to throw some Jersey Shore in there since we're talking about MTV. And there's our friend Snooki. Not only is she drinking, but she's got a cigarette in her hand right there. Um, 
And then a pre-adolescent or adolescent who smokes uh, tobacco or drinks alcohol is 65 times more likely to use marijuana than other kids. So that's kind of a shocking statistic there. Again, I just kind of broke that down in pie graph. I want to point out that this information is from um, pediatrics in 2010. I looked for some newer stuff, but I had a hard time finding something from a good source. Um, in 2010, um, the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act was passed, um, and that actually prohibits um, tobacco companies from advertising at big sporting events like NASCAR or somewhere like that. Um, so this may be a little bit different now. There may be less spent on cigarettes and maybe more on alcohol and prescription drugs. But still, it's a lot. Um, cigarette usage. So 50% of smokers um, began by the age of 13, um, which to me seems really young, but that's what I read. 90% um, began by age 19. So we really need to try to prevent it from starting at a young age so that we don't run into problems later on. Um, nearly half of all teenagers have tried smoking, as have about 20% of eighth graders. Um, cigarette advertising glamorizes smoking. Um, exposure to tobacco marketing and advertising more than doubles the risk of a teenager beginning to smoke. And these are just some, um, these are from a magazine, some little Marlboro ads. So she's up there hanging out, watching the sunset, it's beautiful. Um, then alcohol, um, so, well, let me talk about this study first. So this study that is down at the bottom, um, alcohol consumption in movies and adolescent binge drinking. Um, so this took about 16,500 students from six different countries, including Germany, Iceland, Italy, um, the Netherlands, Poland, and Scotland. Um, and it was a survey, and they gave them a list of 250 movies that were out at the time that were kind of popular, um, and asked them to, to check a, like a box for which movies they had seen, um, and then how many times they had seen that particular movie. And then they added up the number of um, drinking scenes that were in each one of those movies, and um, tried to figure out on average how many scenes that particular person had seen, how many drinking scenes they had seen on the movies. Um, and then they got them to say whether they had ever drank, um, drank only a couple times or had drank a lot. And they kind of compared that to see if um, watching more drinking scenes on movies is associated with them actually drinking more. Um, and what they found was that exposure to PG-13 and R-rated movies at an early age is associated with um, the onset of use of alcohol and tobacco. Um, and then exposure to alcohol consumption in movies is also associated with youth binge drinking. Um, and this exposure is also associated with lifetime binge drinking. So if they start at a young age, they're more likely to continue doing it. Um, and then again, there were six different countries, 16,000 people, so that, and it was pretty consistent across all those six countries. 46% um, of adolescents have tried alcohol by the eighth grade. 77% uh, of adolescents have begun to drink uh, regularly by the 12th grade. 20% um, of eighth graders and 58% uh, right. 20 of eighth graders and 58% of 12th graders have begun to drink before. I know, have been drunk, sorry. Um, and then 30% of adolescent deaths from injuries can be linked to alcohol use. So whether they're drinking and then driving a car, or if they're drinking and they get a gun, or whatever happens, um, that's 30%. Um, and alcohol use is associated with both school failure and high-risk sexual behavior. Um, so I have a couple of um, ads in here that I'll show you all in a minute. So we've all seen alcohol commercials on TV. Everybody's having a great time. They're all, you know, just enjoying life and it makes you want to try it because it looks fun. Um, and then all these advertisements, beer, wine, and liquor are often shown on primetime TV when kiddos are watching it. Um, and then 
teenagers are 400 times more likely to see an alcohol advertisement than um, to see a public service announcement saying why they should not be drinking. And these are just a few of them. He can line dance in a circle. That's the Dos Equis man. I did have a Dos Equis commercial in there, but I took it out. So. <laughs> Um, and this, like, they're having a great time. And so are they. So this makes kiddos want to try it. Um, and just some channels in general that you should tell your parents that their uh, kids should not be watching. MTV, obviously, we've already talked about that a little bit. Uh, Comedy Central isn't the best for kids either. And then Showtime, HBO, we don't want our teenagers watching True Blood. Um, the AAP recommendations, um, again, encourage parents to limit unsupervised media, encourage removal of the TVs from their bedrooms, um, ask the, those two questions, how much screen time are they getting per day, and is there a TV or internet connection in their bedroom? Um, and then encourage parents to limit access to TVs um, that show excessive substance abuse, again, like MTV, HBO, Showtime, those kind of channels. Um, and then encourage parents to limit the younger kids' exposure to PG-13 and R-rated movies. Um, encourage parents to watch TV with them um, or movies with them and talk to them about it. Um, and then turn off the TV during evening meal time. Um, and then make sure your waiting rooms don't have magazines that are advertising cigarette use or alcohol consumption. Right, switching over to um, Obesity, uh, the prevalence of obesity among American youth has doubled in the last three decades. Um, there are actually more overweight and obese adults in the U.S. than there are uh, adults of normal weight. Uh, media, particularly TV, is important in um, obesity. And this is, again, is from that same thing that we talked about earlier, the youth risk behavior surveillance from CDC. Um, and this shows the percentage of high school students who are overweight, and this is based on race. Um, and that's pretty significant. The black females is, I mean, 22%. That's, that's a lot that's overweight. Um, and this is the percentage who are actually obese. It's highest in the Hispanic males, but still it's pretty significant overall. Um, so, why does watching TV contribute to obesity? Um, there's increased sedentary activity. Obviously, you're just sitting there, you're watching TV, you're not up playing, they're not outside. Um, so they don't have as much physical activity as kids that don't watch as much TV. Um, they have unhealthy eating habits that are learned from things that they see on TV or advertisements. And I thought this was funny. See, Mom, normal people get to eat these tasty snacks five times an hour. Um, and then more snacking while they're sitting there watching TV and this is called mindless eating so they're just sitting there with a bag of chips and they'll sit there and they'll eat the entire bag of chips while they're watching a 30 minute hour long TV show and not even realize what they're doing and it interferes with normal sleep patterns like I was talking about earlier if a kid's got a TV set in their bedroom and they're sitting there watching it until 11 12 o'clock at night or, or later um, obviously they're not going to get as much sleep as they would if they didn't have that and these are just some fast food advertisements that I've seen. It kind of grosses me out a little bit. But this is on TV, advertising all these things. A half pound burrito. It's got to be the size of your head, probably. Um, and then mindless eating. It just shows our little kiddo. He's eating some popcorn. There's a bag of chips over there. There's a little Coke or Pepsi or something. He's just having a good time. Um, and then on the opposite end, there's, um, TV watching can also lead to eating disorders. Um, the impact of media on unhealthy body self-image is well documented, um, and some websites are actually geared towards uh, supporting or promoting anorexia or bulimia. Um, this is um, America's Next Top Model. They're all super tall and weigh probably 95 pounds. And this is the Victoria's Secret Fashion Show. It comes on every year. Um, so again, just talking about screening for media usage, um, especially if you have a patient that comes in that does have an eating disorder 
or is obese, um, you really need to make sure you ask the parents about this. Um, that's what I just said. All right, sexual content on TV. This is what I kind of initially wanted to focus most of this talk on. Um, so we'll kind of go through that. So TV shows uh, for teenagers actually contain more sexual content than um, TV shows that are geared towards um, adults, which surprised me. And more than 75% of shows on primetime have some sort of sexual content in them. And less than 14% of these shows um, show any responsibility. So um, it just shows people having casual sex and moving on about their business. It doesn't show any risks of getting pregnant or getting an STD or anything like that. Um, and then several studies uh, link exposure to sexual content at a young age to earlier onset of um, sexual activity. And I'll put this in here because it is Thursday today. So this is the lineup that's on channel three tonight starting at seven o'clock. So we start with Grey's Anatomy. There's always a good little scene in Grey's Anatomy, um, followed by Scandal, which is the reason I'm doing this talk today. Um, and then How to Get Away with Murder. There's a the little Grey's Anatomy advertisement right there for y'all. A little Scandal. Um, so with this sexual content on TV um, and kiddos having sex in an earlier age after being exposed to all this, um, they're at increased risk of pregnancy, obviously, and getting um, sexually transmitted diseases. Um, and media is an important factor in initiation of intercourse for the first time. Um, and like I said earlier, it often portrays casual sex with no consequences. Um, and then there's little or no information about abstinence or sexual responsibility or birth control on any of these shows that we see. And this movie, this just came out this past weekend. Um, do y'all know this movie raised or made uh, $94 million in the first four days? That's crazy to me. And um, I was told yesterday that if you add up all the um, sex scenes in this movie, it comes out to about 20 minutes worth of sex in one movie. And it's, uh, it's rated R, so a lot of kids can go see this. Um, teen sex rates. Um, almost 47% uh, of all students have had sexual intercourse. Um, and again, this is from that, the youth, youth risk behavior surveillance. Um, 34% report sexual intercourse in the past three months. 41% um, report not using a condom the last time that they had sex. That's scary. Um, and the U.S. has the highest rate of teen pregnancy in the Western world. So this is the percentage of high school students who had sex before age 13. Um, not too terribly bad, but obviously the black males have pretty much a predominance there. Um, and this just shows the same thing by grade, so it doesn't really change much per grade, which isn't surprising because this is asking them what they did before they were 13. Um, and this is the percentage of high school students um, who have ever had sex. Um, and you can see the black males up there at about 65% which is a lot, um, and then the black females at about 50%, and then the whites um, all around 40%. So a lot of our high school students have had sex. And it does increase, this one does, um, for grades. So by the time they're seniors in high school, 60% have had sex. <coughs> um, this is actually a good slide right here. This is the number of births and um, the birth rates for teenagers um, in the U.S. And we're actually kind of going down on that, so that's a good thing. Um, we still are higher than anywhere else in the Western world, but we are going down. Um, and then the cost of teenage uh, childbearing in 2010 alone was like $9.4 billion, so that's a lot of money. 
Um, and this shows the birth rates for teenagers. So even though we are trending down, Louisiana is still in the 10 highest states for um, teen birth rates. Um, and of course, early intercourse increases the risk of uh, sexually transmitted infections, including um, HIV. Um, adolescents that are ages uh, 15 to um, 15 to 24 years old, actually, um, it's only about a quarter of the sexually active population, but um, they have about 19 million of the new um, sexually transmitted infections per year. So even though it's not as big a part of the population, their um, STD rate is a lot higher than the other age groups. Um, that's what I just said. Um, and one in four teenager, teenagers has had a uh, sexually transmitted infection. Um, so what, have our, what do our adolescents learn from what they see on TV? Again, I said, you know, teenagers spend more than seven hours per day. Some studies show up to 11 hours per day watching TV. Um, and then all this stuff that they're watching is filled with all these sexual messages and images. Um, a lot of this stuff is not realistic and they may not realize that it's not realistic whenever they're watching it. Um, by 2004, there were more than 30 reality TV shows. Um, again, I talked about Bachelor Pad, where they put all those people together and see what happens. Um, there was also one called Temptation Island a while back. Um, those are not good for our teenagers to watch. Um, and more than 75% of uh, primetime programs do contain um, sexual content. And between 1997 and 2001, the amount of sexual content that was seen on TV nearly doubled. So it went from not having a whole lot of it to now it's just, it's all over the place and a lot of people just don't even think twice about it. Um, talk about sex occurs as often as eight to 10 times per hour on primetime television. Um, so should we screen for media usage? Yes, we should. Um, so media may represent the most important area of anticipatory guidance in our well child visits. Um, and this is actually from uh, Bright Futures right here. Um, and this kind of going back to the media violence, but um, one or two minutes of counseling about media violence could reduce uh, violence exposure for nearly a million children per year. So it's really important that we talk to our parents about this and just kind of make them think about what their kids are watching because it just, it may not even cross their minds that they need to be watching for that. Again, two questions to ask. How much uh, screen time per day does the child spend? Um, and is there a TV set or an internet connection in the child's bedroom? Um, ask more questions if they're having uh, behavior problems. There's actually a, a media risk form that you can get on the AAP's website. It's a two-page form. Um, you can print them out and have them at your office and just hand them to the parent whenever they come in, they can fill it out while they're waiting for you to come in the room and then you've got a more detailed assessment of what's going on as far as their media usage. Um, and anticipatory, anticipatory guidance, um, tell them to limit screen time to fewer than two hours per day, um, encourage careful selection of programs, uh, watch the shows and discuss the content with the kids. Um, teach them critical viewing skills, um, limit their time spent with media, and especially avoid movies that are rated PG-13 or rated R. Um, and advise parents to be good media role models. So tell your parents not to be watching Scandal while their kids are running around. <laughs> um, establish screen-free zones, especially in their bedrooms. Um, emphasize alternative act activities, get them up, get them outside, go play ball, do something else instead of sitting there watching TV. Um, and again, create an electronic media free environment in their bedrooms. Um, so for pediatricians, we just need to become more educated uh, about what all is out there. Um, and again, ask those questions. I told y'all I was going to repeat that several times. Um, and then take a more detailed media history if they're having any issues. And examine your own media habits. Um, studies have shown that uh, pediatricians who watch a lot of TV are less likely to screen for TV use in their patients and less likely to advise them not to watch um, as much TV as they might be watching. And then recommend 
same thing. Um, like I said earlier, no screen time for kiddos less than two. Um, one study said not even Baby Einstein or anything like that because they they don't know what they're watching. Um, keep TV and internet out of the bedrooms. Uh, monitor what they're watching. Watch movies with them. Um, and then have a, a plan set up for use in your home. So say they come home from school, they've got to do their homework, then they can watch TV for an hour or so, and then um, time to start getting ready for bed or something like that, or go outside and play while it's still daylight outside, then they can watch TV right before bedtime. And then enforce a meal time and a bedtime curfew. And then if you're ever, um, if you ever have the opportunity to kind of work with schools, if you're, um, if any of us uh, pediatricians that are in residency right now are going to a smaller community, you may have the opportunity to kind of work with schools a little bit. Um, so you want to educate them um, about the health risks associated with all of this media access. Um, kind of encourage schools not to have movie days or anything like that if you can. Um, encourage the continuation and expansion of media education programs um, to let schools and parents kind of know what their kids need to be doing, um, encourage critical thinking whenever the kids are watching TV, um, encourage use of technology such as online education programs, um, and work with parent-teacher associations to encourage <coughs> parents' guidance in limiting the amount of screen time. All right, now I'm just going to touch kind of briefly on um, social media. Um, I didn't do a whole lot on this, but um, kiddos have Facebook accounts, they've got Twitter, they've got all these things that I don't even know what some of these stand for. Um, so internet usage and social media. Up to 90% of Americans use the internet. 61% um, of teenagers have either a desktop or a laptop computer. 84% um, of teenagers have home internet access. 64% um, of online teens by the age of 12 to 17 have created or posted something on the web, whether it's on Facebook or Twitter or a blog or whatever, they've done it. 73% um, of teenagers with internet access use um, social networking websites, and this is up from 55% in 2006, so it is increasing. Um, there are some benefits of um, adolescents using social media. Um, it increases their so socialization so they can connect more with friends and family. Um, sometimes if there's like a charity or community event or something coming up, they'll advertise it on Facebook or wherever. Um, so they may can get more involved in community things because of that. Um, they can, if they're into singing or any sort of music or anything like that, they can post these things on these websites and kind of share what they like to do. Um, create bl blogs, which kind of promotes them to be more creative. Um, and then to help foster um, individual identity um, and some social skills. And then another thing is enhanced learning opportunities. So some schools will put their homework online or um, kids will come in and form like a Facebook group that's a study group. Um, so they kind of will sometimes use it for that. And then they have increased access to health information. Now this one you need to tell your parents to kind of watch out for because they might be reading some stuff that's not quite true. Um, they might read things saying you can't get pregnant the first time you have sex or something like that because it's out there. Um, so that one you need to watch out for. And then the risks of social media. So cyberbullying is one thing. So we know that kiddos can be kind of mean and they can bully each other. Um, and cyberbullying is kind of the new one. It's the online harassment of um, kids. And this can cause um, depression, anxiety, social isolation, all kinds of problems from this. And um, whereas bullying that we're used to is more common in boys, cyberbullying is actually more common in girls. Um, so that's something to really watch out for. Um, sexting. Is Dr. Rhodes in here? <laughs> so Dr. Rhodes did a nice big morning report on sexting. Um, this is the sending, receiving, forwarding um, of sexually explicit messages um, via cell phone, computer, or any other digital device. Um, and about 20% of adolescents have either sent or received some sort of um, sexual message. 
And then Facebook depression. I had never heard of this before I looked into this, but um, this is a new term um, that's it's like kiddos spend a, a ton of time sitting there looking on Facebook and then they see all these other people out having fun and doing fun things and they think, well, my life's not as fun, my life's not as good, and they end up getting depressed. Um, so Facebook depression is a, a new thing out there. Um, and they kind of feel socially isolated sometimes, even though they can see what all their friends are doing at all times. It's not real contact with their friends. And then just some other concerns, privacy. Um, anything that they post out there is there, even if they delete it. So if somebody is 17 and they're out drinking and partying and they're posting all these pictures on Facebook of them out having a good time and then six years down the road they want to apply to medical school. Well, even though it's deleted, there's a possibility that someone could go back and find that stuff and it could affect their future or if they're applying for a job or something like that. Um, so what goes online stays online. Um, and I think that's one thing that adolescents don't realize. They think that they can delete it and then it's gone and they never have to worry about it again. So we just need to let them know that that's not exactly how it works. Um, and then again, the influence of advertisements, kind of like um, on TV, um, very similar. So how young is too young? Most social media sites require that adolescents be at least 13 years old in order to get on um, unless they have some sort of parental consent saying that it's okay. And this is um, part of the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Um, I read an article, I don't know, it was in one of the either AAP News or one of those just recently about um, Facebook changing their privacy. Um, they used to, for kids that were 13 to 17 years old, um, they automatically had to have like the most secure privacy. So only their friends could see their stuff um, and they couldn't get it to where other people could kind of see what they're doing. But now they've changed that and their privacy settings are the same as anybody else's. Um, so they can make it to where everybody, even people they don't know, can see what they're doing. Um, so parents need to look at these sites, um, make sure that they are appropriate for the child's age um, whenever they're using them. Cell phone apps. This one scared me because I had never heard of most of these. Um, uh, Yik Yak. Has anybody heard of Yik Yak before? No. Um, so with this one, they can post messages that are up to 200 characters long and it can be viewed by the 500 yakers who are closest um, in proximity to them. Um, and this is based on GPS tracking. So you would think that they could, somebody could probably figure out where you are and come find you with this if they wanted to. And this is what the app looks like. So anybody that's got kids, you might want to look at their phones and see if you see any of these things on here. Um, Snapchat, I know a lot of us have probably heard of or used Snapchat. Um, this allows users to send pictures um, or messages that disappear after 10 seconds. Um, but if somebody sends you a picture and you screenshot it, you've got it. Um, and then they don't really go away. It's kind of like the Facebook thing. If you have a picture and you delete it, it's not really gone. Um, and some teenagers will think, oh, well, I can take a nude picture of myself and I can send it to so-and-so and I'll just Snapchat it and then it's gone. That's not necessarily true. And that's what that one looks like. Um, kick Messenger. Um, this allows kids to send private messages and their parents can't see them. So watch out for that one. That's what that one looks like. Um, poof. Poof is an app that allows kids to, with the touch of one button, delete any apps they don't want their parents to see. So if they've got Snapchat or whatever, Yik Yak or any of those other ones that are on there and they don't want their parents to know, they hit a button, they're gone. So if their mom's checking their phone, it makes it real easy so they don't get in trouble. Um, Whisper. Whisper is one that um, encourages users to post any secrets that they might have. Um, they're supposedly posting them anonymously and don't have to put in any information about themselves. Again, I've not tried this app out myself, so I'm not real sure how it works. Um, but people can search for um, users that are using this Whisper app that are within a mile. 
Um, and the article that I was reading about these um, different apps said there was actually a 12 year old little girl who was using this Whisper app and she was raped because um, a guy figured out where she was because she was within a mile of him and he went and he raped her. That's what that one looks like. And then down. This app used to be called Bang with Friends. Yeah, so this one uses Facebook and you can um, find friends on Facebook or friends of friends and decide if that's somebody you would like to um, meet. <laughs> um, that's awful. And this is what that one looks like. If your kids have that on their phone, you need to permanently ground them. <sighs> okay, so what is our role as far as uh, social media? So we need to talk to children about um, internet use and social media usage. Um, talk to parents about it. Kind of let the parents know what all's out there, what to look out for. Um, advise parents to become better educated about technology um, and what their kids are using, what they're doing online. Um, discuss an online use plan. Um, ensure the appropriate privacy settings for their kids. Um, discuss the importance of parental supervision of the children's online activities so make sure they know exactly what their kids are doing online. Um, and then the AP encourages us as pediatricians to increase our knowledge of technology and we've got to know what's there so we can tell our parents what's there. So that's pretty important for us. Um, that's all I've got. These are just some um, website resources that um, you can either use for yourself or you can um, tell some families about it. Obviously the AAP is a really good one, but there's several of them on here. Um, and you can search these things. It's real easy to find articles on it. There are a million articles on different things like this. Um, so pretty much anything you want to see. That The media history form that's down there, that's the one that's at the AAP's website. That's the form you can print out and you can have at your office. Um, again, it's a two-page form and you can just get your parents to fill it out. It's a quick way to um, ask them. These are my sources. And that's my stepson. And his selfie. <laughs> Upside down selfie.
you know, they are, what, you know, you're showing advertisement for alcohol, or violence. I don't know whether when you're reading, you realize that the Silicon Valley, there are young companies that are coming out with apps, they're putting uh, YouTube or Facebook, uh, they're competing with them because their money is coming from advertising, from alcohol, from gun, uh, these, you know, sex uh, advertisement and other stuff. So that's amazing. So in other words, AP is competing with the giants which are overnight becoming very popular and the multi-billion dollar company is setting up that. Yeah. I know that for sure because I know a lot of yeah. my own kid and other kids here in the marketing department. No, that's where the money that they put in young people who go to these people and ask them to give the money to advertise on YouTube or advertise right. Facebook. Um, well, with your first question, um, I didn't read any specific um, sort of educational materials or anything, but um, some of these uh, have some really good stuff on them. Um, I don't know anything specifically, but these are some good resources that you can tell your parents about. Because this is not just for pediatricians. This, these are based, um, like, for families, too. Um, especially the, the common sense media when I did look at that one and they had some pretty good stuff on there that's at a parent's level where you know they can read it and they'll can be at you know they'll know what's going on I don't know about videos though if there's any educational videos um, your second question um, as far as catching these kids when they're young that's why the recommendation is that every well child visit, not every teenage well child visit, every well child visit. So at two months of age, when they come in for their first, you know, well child visit at two, or even two weeks, um, you can tell them, you know, we don't recommend that you have your kid watching TV. Um, don't put them in front of the iPad. And you can talk to them and tell them that um, at that age they don't know what's going on. Um, and just kind of educate them at that point. But you can start young, and that is the recommendation, is to start at a young age doing that. It, it needs to start at a young age. My fourth grader just finished her social studies project, and it was called Fourth Graders Going Mobile. And she surveyed 63 fourth grade students in her, class, in her school, and almost half of them had gotten their own first mobile device before they were eight years old. All 63 of them had a mobile device. And almost half of them had gotten it before they were eight years old. So you do need to start her. Mm -hmm. As a mom of a 15 month old, it is extremely hard not to use media. Um, but I've done a lot of research and starting media before two years old changes the way the neurons are pruned in the brain. It causes ADD, it causes several things. And just like she talked about desensitization, it's the same thing. Also, there's a difference between foreground and background. So these kids that are exposed to us watching TV, they're also becoming desensitized. Um, I learned that hard watching Sopranos when my baby was